Hello, I am Kyle Ferrier, a fellow and director of academic affairs at KEI, and welcome to our event this morning titled Reforging the Middle, Emerging Expert Perspectives on South Korean Middle Power Diplomacy. Before we get into today's program, I just wanted to say how excited we are at KEI about the forthcoming discussion to highlight the papers written by our emerging expert speakers that are now either up on our website or will be up in the coming days as part of our special report series. The growing rivalry between the United States and China presents new challenges for middle powers like South Korea, but as our speakers will soon point out, Seoul is well positioned to shape its own future if it seizes on the right opportunities. The event and papers really wouldn't be possible if not for today's moderator, Jeff Robertson, who was a tremendous help in shaping the papers in a workshop we held over the summer. A special thanks to him and to all of our speakers really for joining us from across the globe, from Canada to Europe to Korea. Before I turn things over to Jeff, though, I have the honor of introducing everyone. Uh, so first up, our moderator, as I mentioned, is Dr. Jeffrey Robertson, an Associate Professor of Diplomatic Studies at Yonsei University and a visiting fellow at the Korea Studies Research Hub at the University of Melbourne. He is author of multiple works on South Korea's diplomatic practice and administration, including his 2016 book, Diplomatic Style and Foreign Policy, A Case Study of South Korea, and is a recognized expert on middle power diplomacy. Uh, for our emerging experts, first up, we have Cindy Kim, who's a, P a PhD candidate in the Department of European and International Studies at King's College London. She's a KF Indo-Pacific Program Visiting Fellow at the Royal University Services Institute, or RUSI. Her research interests include international relations of East Asia, particularly regionalism, South Korea foreign policy, and middle power diplomacy. Uh, and then we'll have Carolyn Weffer. She's a series editor at Foreign Policy Rising and a senior consultant and researcher at Deloitte. Uh, her research covers transatlantic alliances in East Asia, specifically with South Korea, and she previously worked with the German Marshall Front Fund. And then we'll have Dong Woo Kim, who is a first year G JD candidate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto, and a junior fellow at Massey College. Prior to starting law school, he managed the research program that focused on technology governments at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. And he's also a contributing author to KEI's blog, The Peninsula. So with that, I'll turn things over now to Jeff to get us started. Thank you very much, Kyle. And thanks, mm -hmm. to, the, thanks to the Korea Economic Institute for arranging this. Um, I think it's a really great initiative and um, helping out emerging scholars um, build up their uh, abilities in areas such as middle power diplomacy, I think is really important. If you're a, a young scholar on Korean affairs and are interested in middle power diplomacy, that's the place to watch, the Korea Economic Institute. So it's great to be talking to these emerging experts today. And they've each written a really interesting paper. And I encourage everyone to read it when you get the chance. Now, there's one element which runs through each of the papers. And that element is the overarching belief that middle powers can make a difference. There's a degree of positivity there that middle powers can reforge the middle. And so dominant and pervading, it really brought out my inner cynic. But I've come up with a way, a strategy to handle that. To make the ensuing discussion a little bit more interesting, and to ensure the spotlight really shines upon our emerging scholars, I'm going to take upon a role which they are going to have to get used to, very used to, if they keep on working on middle powers. I'm gonna play the role of devil's advocate. Semi, Dongu, Carolyn, when you say yes, I am gonna say no. When you say middle powers can make a difference, I'm gonna say they can't make a difference. Reflecting this, well, there's no better time to study middle powers. That doesn't mean it's a good time to study middle powers. That just means there's no better time. The middle power concept with its gaping holes in its theory and its application remains immensely popular way to explain South Korea's foreign policy, but it really doesn't matter. Middle powers, it means nothing. So, Without further ado, I'll turn over to our emerging experts. You're each going to have around five minutes to tell the audience about your paper and to prove me wrong. After that, we'll have around about 15 minutes for discussion, and then we'll have around about the same amount of time for audience questions. 
So I remind the audience, if you have any questions, please make sure you put them down in the uh, YouTube chat area and uh, we'll make sure that we ask our emerging experts. So without any further hesitation, uh, Semi, would you like to start? Yep, sure, thank you. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you to Korea Economic Institute for this workshop. Uh, thank you to the speakers and the uh, uh, viewers who are joining us from various different time zones. I'm very grateful to Kyle and Dr. Robertson. Your feedback has been very helpful in writing this paper. Um, so I'll jump right into it. Uh, the key point of my article um, is that South Korea's mode of strategic ambiguity is an unsustainable approach to the US-China tensions, and that rather South Korea should double down on its middle power diplomacy, especially its commitment to multilateralism. Um, so the reasoning behind strategic amb ambiguity is that South Korea cannot risk having poor relations with either the US or China. The idea is that trade relations with China is just too big and that the U.S. is South Korea's most important ally. And, and this, is, this is both very true. But over time, it's becoming clear that strategic ambiguity is uh, reaching its limits. Um, and I say there are several reasons for this. First, it's difficult to take this categorical view of the U.S. just in terms of security and China just in terms of economy or trade. Um, we're seeing that over time, the lines between security and economy are blurring. And second, there's no guarantee that taking a strategically ambiguous stance will shield South Korea from, uh, from, from like the fallout of US-China tensions. And third, there may come a point in the future where there's a clear expectation for South Korea to state where it stands on a given issue. Um, and if there's continued ambiguity, there's a danger that other countries would try to sway or to try to influence South Korea's position. And in this way, strategic ambiguity could actually have the effect of a limiting South Korea's autonomy. And so rather than sticking to strategic ambiguity, um, South Korea should strengthen its role as a middle power or what I phrase as principled middle power diplomacy. Um, and this, uh, this refers to the kind of diplomacy that goes back to the classical uh, notions of middle powers, the practice of coalition building, acting as catalysts, uh, facilitators, and managers. Um, it also advocates holding upholding values that reflect the current liberal order. So values like free trade, rule of law, multilateralism, democratic values, and so on. Um, and the aim of this principled middle power diplomacy would be to shape the environment in which the US-China tensions are unfolding and uh, through the creation of networks, Use, usage of multilateralism, minilateral frameworks, and also in cooperation with other middle powers to try to moderate the, the extremities of this great power competition. And if we look at South Korea's middle power diplomacy to date, um, the concept of middle powers, it seems, was used rather kind of uh, inconsistently. There was a lack of continuity. But uh, um, this isn't necessarily unique to South Korea. Other middle powers have also had um, fluctuations in the kinds of middle power diplomacy they adopt. Uh, there is literature on why different middle powers behave differently. And one of them suggests that in order to understand why a middle power behaves a certain way, there has to be a study of the, the context, the content, and the choice that the, the, the state is facing. And uh, this leads to the final point um, in my article, which is that rather than projecting middle power roles through an ideological lens, um, for example, rebranding middle power roles every time there's a change in administration, uh, I argue that there has to be more focus on the kinds of principles that South Korea identifies with and how those can be uh, projected through its middle power diplomacy. Um, it's important because domestically, this will ensure greater continuity across administrations. And externally, doing this will provide some degree of predict predictability of where South Korea would uh, stand on a given issue. And I think in general, it just fits better with the, of the aspirations that South Korea has in terms of uh, being an advanced and developed country. And uh, South Korea can do this by reinforcing its commitment to multilateralism. Um, this will allow uh, diversification, deepening of relations with various countries, um, providing opportunities to carry out niche diplomacy. Um, it, it reinforces a good practices of dialogue, development of norms that can sustain this liberal order. 
And uh, yes, in many respects, Korea is doing this, and the new southern policy is one example. And uh, the latter part of my article provides some recommendations that go beyond this. And one of them is to revitalize the Mitka grouping. So in two years, 2023, will be the 10-year anniversary of Mitka, Mitka, which was set up during the Park Geun-hye administration as a grouping of middle powers, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, Australia. Um, and South Korea should use this 10-year anniversary as an opportunity to prepare a blueprint for the next 10 years, uh, provide a concrete agenda with actionable plans. Um, we can think of something like a Mikta Plus, you know, where we bring in uh, other countries, maybe China and the US, and to cooperate on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. Uh, South Korea could also consider participating in other multilateral frameworks driven by other middle powers, um, uh, such as the CPTPP or the Quad Plus. Um, okay, I will stop here. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, uh, Carolyn, would you like to have your turn next? Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And I can only echo um, Sami's thank you to KEI, to Kyle, and to Dr. Robertson for this great opportunity with this workshop. And um, my argument basically um, follows immediately um, Sami's exploration on uh, principled middle powers. And I took it a step further to see in which um, policy areas um, South Korea could follow that part. So I argue in a similar vein um, to Sami that um, we need to think about which middle power definition applies best to South Korea and which avenue is more, most suitable to its foreign policy ambitions. And what I found um, most particularly is that, um, as Sami said, um, there is the strategic ambiguity out of the concern to choose between China and the United States because of the strong economic ties and the strong military ties and partnership. Um, but this uh, strategic ambiguity in the long run will most likely not be feasible because of the demand to choose um, between the two sides and also the um, exogenous shocks of the increasing rivalry to which South Korea being at the middle is uh, particularly susceptible. And um, what South Korea is currently following is um, an increased literal definition of middle power in the sense of being um, situated literally in the middle between two great powers um, and that it would be fruitful for the country to focus back on what Sami called um, principled middle power diplomacy and I uh, called the figurative definition. So bridge builder, multilateralist, um, upholding values and um, following that avenue um, in which South Korea has previously uh, branded itself successfully as a nation um, and followed that avenue of the middle power definition. And the specific case studies that I've looked at um, where South Korea could follow this path um, and what this actually would allow South Korea to do um, is something that also Sami's mentioned before, um, I looked at trade agreements um, because South Korea is globally a strong economic um, actor. It has a, a large net of free trade agreements um, that allows the country to diversify its ties, which will be essential in the future um, to be able to forge a bit of a third avenue outside of the sandwich position in a way. And so I looked at RCEP and also CPTPP um, because that allows Korea um, to play out its strong regional and also a global economic role. Um, and I also uh, looked at the G7 um, at which South Korea had a guest role and argued that um, being invited um, to these fora um, allows South Korea to um, build on its multilateral initiatives and also shape the discussion um, around these fora and also the redefinition of these fora um, in light of um, the great power conflict, which means that South Korea will also have the opportunity to um, emerge from a sort of rule taker and um, towards more of a rule maker and base that on um, the nation branding of bridge builder as it has done, for example, by hosting the G20 um, and um, multilateralist. And um, yeah, moving forward, um, 
the essential um, the essential path for South Korea that I found is um, the attempt to diversify its ties um, and reconsider which middle power um, strategy it likes to pursue, and that it manages to move away from the literal um, definition of a middle power being sandwiched, which actually limits South Korea's foreign policy and move towards um, the more figurative or principled definition of um, a bridge builder and a multilateralist. And uh, I hand it back to you, Jeffrey. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've heard several definitions already. We're probably going to get more, right, Dongwu? Your turn. Okay, uh, yeah, so I would like to echo the thank yous here as well. Uh, it's always exciting and life affirming to be uh, participating in conversations like this with uh, smart, uh, intelligent people. So uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So uh, my paper uh, is uh, rather, uh, it's a conceptual paper. Uh, and um, I attempted to bring together uh, two concepts that are uh, you know, seem to be nebulous, uh, one being middle power and then the other, the fourth industrial industrial revolution. Um, so I guess uh, the paper was based on the idea that the ongoing transition of our uh, entire world uh, into the fourth industrial revolution presented a unique context uh, at all levels of governance that, that warranted the, uh, the examination as to whether middle power con uh, middle power con uh, concepts could be applied to uh, explain uh, the impact of a fourth industrial revolution vice, uh, vice versa. So uh, initially, I had an order of the presentation that uh, I prepared, but then, uh, upon Dr. Uh, Robertson's initial <laughs> introduction as a devil's advocate, I decided to beef up this section a little more. So. Um, the argument that I make is that uh, the fourth industrial revolution, which is defined as a, as a shift in our society, uh, along with the technology that fuses uh, you know, the physical, digital, and biological domains and strengthen the interconnect, uh, in, interconnectivity and it interdependence of systems, uh, create a new policy environment where middle powers could potentially uh, play a role. And uh, that is also justified in the sense that great powers, uh, China and the United States, uh, their engagement with, with each other are being seen through the lens of a technological competition. But it's not just the technology, but also how technology is governed, how technology is leveraged or used. So, um, and the, uh, the impact of such a fusion of technological and geopolitical is seen in, for example, the, uh, the spat between South Korea and Japan over the, uh, the, uh, the rare chemical uh, for uh, it, during the earlier part of the trade war in 2018, 2017, or the creation of a, a supply chain ministry uh, for the new cabinet in Japan, the conversations of creating a T12 uh, it, uh, with the American leadership, or the emphasis on the uh, liberal uh, or democratic values in promoting uh, the governance research of new technologies uh, such as artificial intelligence. So in that context, what I argue is that middle powers, uh, which is defined as uh, using pr uh, Professor Robertson's definition, uh, a state with an interest in and capacity to work proactively uh, to contribute to the development and strengthening of institutions for the governance of the global commons, uh, in this context, uh, we should be looking at how uh, how uh, there can be a, a fourth industrial revolution middle power that has particular uh, assets to address the uh, particular challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. So within my paper, I uh, outlined three conditions uh, for the fourth industrial revolution middle powerism. First one, technology, uh, that, that there has to be some basic technological capacity in order to exercise uh, some legitimacy. Second, uh, networks. So technology and technology governance requires not only the straight, uh, state leadership, but also uh, the uh, collaboration with non-government uh, non private sector stakeholders. How do we leverage that? And then uh, related to that idea is governance. Uh, because the fourth industrial revolution is a systemic change with emphasis on interconnectivity and uh, interdependence, uh, the ability to govern uh, this technology well it, uh, can be an asset that allows 
uh, uh, middle power states to form coalition or to play the role of the bridge builder. Um, so uh, in my paper, <laughs> I provide more data and substance as to why South Korea uh, has those three uh, conditions uh, to play the role of a uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution middle power uh, with great emphasis on governance. I think I'm running out of time, but uh, I uh, look forward to substantiating my claims uh, in the Q&A session. I must say, I really, I really like that one. I think that has a real blend of bringing the middle power concept more modern and also um, pushing Korea into the question as well. But um, back to my role as devil's advocate and cynic. So um, the, the audience out there probably knows that every middle power presentation or every middle power academic paper starts with a definition of what a middle power is. So I want each of you guys in as concise as terms as possible to say what you believe a middle power is. Okay. Say me, starting with you. Okay. Um, middle power is a, a countries that have specific attributes in terms of geographic, normative, and behavioral. And in terms of behavioral traits, we can include things like their preference for multilateralism, uh, promoting compromise, their ability to act as good international citizens, um, their expertise in promoting niche diplomacy and focusing on uh, uh, promoting specific agendas through skills like entrepreneurial flair and acting as catalysts. So that's how I would define middle powers. All right, there's a future academic there for sure. <laughs> Good. Okay, Carolyn? Is it all right to just say I agree? <laughs> Um, actually, my definition is uh, quite uh, similar to Saini's, um, that um, a middle power is um, a specific type of country um, categorized through um, location, um, size, and normative factors um, that include, as we've previously mentioned, um, bridge builder, good international citizen, multilateralist. Um, and I would add on to that um, the, ex uh, the exercise of nation branding and self-identification um, that middle powers also create a narrative about themselves that follow these um, normative aspects. Okay. Yeah, um, so it's not exactly the same as semis. It's, a, it's verging off a little bit there. Dongu, in as concise a term as possible. Oh, I used your definition in my uh, <laughs> in the paper uh, as part of the literature review, but then uh, I guess in my paper I really emphasize the uh, the constructivist uh, elements of our middle powers. Uh, perhaps touching a little bit on Carolyn's uh, final points about the narratives and such. But then uh, it is important uh, that uh, there is a uh, degree of credibility uh, from other states in seeing them as, uh, you know, a states that they can work with, uh, that they can collaborate with uh, beyond uh, sort of the ideological uh, bifurcation and such, uh, and such. So I think of it uh, more theoretically, like as a uh, golden mean kind of a thing. It's very contextual. It depends on what kind of geopolitical environment we're talking about. So today we can talk about it in context of uh, China-US rivalry, but then how uh, that could change uh, decades down the road, uh, I don't know. But then uh, I think that there we'll have to find another middle by using our practical wisdom, uh, the Aristotelian. Concept. Okay, cool. I'm going to put you all on the spot here. I'm going to make it difficult and I'm going to push harder on this. All right. I'm going to give you each a country and you tell me whether that country is a middle power according to your definitions. Okay. Um, Semi, you're going to have Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a G20 member, it's a 19th largest economy, it's hugely influential within its region. Is it a middle power? Carolyn, you're going to have Brazil eighth largest economy, hugely influential within its region. Originally a strong supporter of the middle power concept at the end or the start of the, sorry, the start of the UN, but we don't really consider it a middle power anymore. And then lastly, Dongru, you're going to get Russia. Russia is just one rank ahead of South Korea in GDP in nominal terms. Why, why don't we call it a middle power? Semi, what do you think?
Okay, um, I think based on uh, the geographic or based on the quantitative um, indicators, maybe Saudi Arabia could be categorized as a middle power. At the very least, it fulfills the minimal criteria. But it's, uh, it's I'm, I'm not sure how I would categorize Saudi Arabia in terms of the behavioral traits. Uh, I just don't know enough about Saudi Arabia's uh, behavior. And there's some serious challenges uh, to its position in, in, the, in the region. And especially in recent years, I'm not sure if I could comfortably say that Saudi Arabia is a middle power, at least just in the behavioral traits. Okay, cool. Uh, Carolyn? Similarly so, um, with Brazil, I of course also um, thought immediately um, of the BRICS grouping um, that got much acclaim in earlier years, um, but has since also been contested in terms of the uh, variance of countries in that grouping. Um, in terms of the quantitative uh, qualifiers, I would also agree that it could be classified as a middle power, um, but in terms of the more normative um, qualifications, um, I would say in terms of good international uh, citizen, um, following a rules-based order um, and the bridge builder, especially um, through uh, the current uh, Brazilian administration, um, that's been a very much challenged, um, these, these normative uh, qualifications. And I would therefore also not be entirely comfortable to qualify Brazil as a middle power. Oh, you got the oh. easiest one. <laughs> I got the easiest one. Russia is a middle power. No, it's not. Um, so. Uh, I'm not a, I, I have not studied Russia. Uh, I have the premise with that. But then uh, it's a, uh, first of all, I have a question as to whether they identify as a middle power themselves, uh, but regardless of how they behave, because they, uh, they were uh, a superpower before. And I'm not sure how much of that identity they hold on to and how much of the, uh, how much of that narrative they project uh, in their foreign policy. Um, and also in terms of behaviors and uh, uh, the identity uh, today, um, Russia is not a state that is approachable. It, 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 it comes with baggages when you engage with Russia, um, not uh, for uh, perhaps for former Soviets or uh, Central Asia it might be easier, but then for Western economists, for example, um, because of the geopolitical tension, it comes with uh, some degree of baggages. So, but that being said, um, I might be wrong because I have not studied Russia in depth. Okay, so yeah, it's it's still pretty difficult to say what a middle power is. Okay, we all know that uh, South Korea is a middle power because the papers were on South Korea as a middle power, and we pretty much know that Australia is also a middle power um, because all of the papers that you've read about the history of middle powers mentions Australia. Then why are South Korea and Australia so different in their reactions to current events in, for example, the, the strategic environment? They're both middle powers. Why are they so different? Sammy? Um, sure. Um, I think, uh, as I said briefly in my presentation and in my paper, different middle powers behave uh, middle powers behave differently depending on the context and depending on the situation that they're surrounded in. Um, North Northeast Asia is a very crowded region in the sense that South Korea is surrounded by countries that are very powerful. You know, Korea has maybe the tenth largest economy, but that doesn't really matter if the countries surrounding Korea are the second, third largest economies, third, fifth, fourth, fifth largest militaries. Uh, there's a lot of unresolved disputes. They all have different interests and so on. And so naturally, these conditions um, that South Korea is under is very different from the conditions that Australia is under. Um, and so you will it's impossible to have two middle powers that will respond in, in, in the same way to their external environment. OK, uh, Carolyn. I would agree with Sammy there um, that it very much depends on the context. Um, I can, <laughs> as, you, as you see also from the definition um, with, with, with Sammy's principle diplomacy, I'm, I'm very much uh, on the same page with her. But um, also uh, in terms of history and um, historically the alliances um, or the history of the country as a middle power, um, we've started with Australia and Canada many decades ago, whereas um, the conversation of South Korea being a middle power um, is in comparison um, 
much newer. Um, and of course, Australia, by virtue of that, has been embedded in um, a different original alliance system. Um, some would um, in its orientation, even classify Australia as a Western country, um, which for South Korea is not the case. Um, it's a factor of debate, but um, in terms of um, the trajectory of the middle power narrative um, that a country has built and how long that has been in conversation, and um, that, of course, also very much shapes um, how that middle power um, acts today based on the strategic context it was born out of. Okay, good. But Carolyn, uh, next time I'm going to ask you first, so you can't say I agree with Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, Dongu, what do you think? Oh, I agree with uh, no. Um, <laughs> I do agree that it's very context uh, dependent, and uh, I was thinking a lot about the um, uh, sort of the cultural or even like civilizational similarities uh, that Australia shares with the rest of the. Uh, Commonwealth allies uh, or Anglo uh, allies, and then South Korea, sort of sharing, uh, you know, bits of the scenic uh, civilization as well. Like uh, Korean children still do read uh, the Romance of Three Kingdoms and uh, learn about Chinese history growing up. Um, so maybe we can look at that too as a as a factor. But then the most important thing I think is the election at the end of the day. It's the geopolitical context, and then how it shapes the uh, domestic political uh, conversations because. Uh, if Korea ends up electing a conservative president, then I think, uh, or it had Korea elected a conservative president instead of uh, President Moon, for example, then uh, I would be inclined to think that uh, maybe the country would have taken a, a tougher stance on China. Uh, I, I think there is that element of uh, uh, political uh, uh, dem uh, democratic politics as well. Um, not sure to what degree, uh, which has to be tamed by economic and uh, political interests uh, that are inherent. But uh, I think partisan politics do matter, especially today. Okay, good. Um, I like those points. And I think it kind of proves the, the cynic's view is two states can be middle powers, but it all depends upon their context. Why are we even talking about middle powers? But on the other side, not being a cynic for, for a moment, there's, there's a quite uh, old paper now by uh, one of my favorite papers by John Ravenhill. And he notes that middle powers have cycles of activism. And these cycles of activism are caused by, sometimes caused by domestic politics. So things such as the personal interests of leaders, which I think several of you mentioned, uh, the differentiation even between foreign ministers or the growing interest of domestic uh, foreign policy interests. Um, it can be caused by partisanship between different political parties. So given that fact, in your opinion, what are some of the domestic influences that have impacted South Korea as a middle power and what could potentially impact it as a middle power into the future? Uh, Carolyn, you're going first this time. I knew it. Um, it's it's difficult to say because when we look at the middle power definition, and we've mentioned this in this round before, and um, that South Korea used, it's swaying dependent on the administration in power. Um, so it's not uh, necessarily always based on the external urgency and the international uh, community. Um, you know, the urgency of the rivalry, for example, in this case between the US and China, then, but also in uh, how far. Um, the middle power narrative is used by the administration in charge. Um, and that, of course, depends um, on um, the main interests um, at heart. Is the administration more China leaning, more US leaning? Um, does it have trade interests? Does it have more multilateral interests? For example, um, sustainability um, or development where South Korea has also been leading, um, which of course will lean the country um, towards more multilateralism or a potentially more hawkish um, stance, um, which will in the future, um, and this is also a bit what I argue um, to kind of reconsider 
which middle power definition will be more su most fruitful for the country. Um, and that is definitely the bridge builder and multilateralist. Um, and that it will be most helpful for South Korea moving forward, also in the diversification of its ties and its international standing, um, to agree on a thread um, for that middle power definition. And of course, that will be difficult from administration to administration, but um, that would be um, a goal to try to attain and that there's agreement moving forward, um, also longer term agreement on what kind of middle power definition South Korea would like to follow across administrations. Okay, good. Uh, Simi? You agree with Carolyn? Uh, <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> um, I think there is um, there's two aspects to this. There's actually areas of middle power diplomacy in South Korea that haven't been uh, cycles that have been consistent. And these include things like peacekeeping operations, official development assistance. And what we can, what, what it looks like it's cyclical is things that are uh, determined because of the changes in administration. So we have starting from Kim Dae-jung's Sunshine Policy, Do Moon's Peace and Prosperity in East Asia, Lee Myung-bak's New Asia Initiative, Park Geun-hye's NAPC, and Moon Jae-in's NAPCOR. They all, uh, they all have aspects of middle power diplomacy. They all try to act as facilitators or mediators, but where they differ is how South Korea should approach the North Korea issue or the US alliance. So the tensions in the ideological tensions between the progressives and the conservatives gives the impression of the cycles of middle power activism in Korea. The progressives want to see Korea, South Korea have greater engagement with North Korea. They want to see South Korea as the driving force behind it. So you have policies like North uh, Sunshine Policy or Peace or Prosperity in Northeast Asia, which locate Korea right in the center of the North Korea pro problem. Whereas the conservative bloc want to see greater coordination between South Korea and the US in managing the North, North Korea problem. And the conservatives have located South Korea's middle power activism in the broader international agenda on things like nuclear security or green growth. So um, this, what you would, what, what would appear to be cycles of middle power activism isn't necessarily an anomaly, but the way that I, uh, my, my perception of it is that it's, it's a hindrance because it makes South Korea's middle power activism inconsistent and lacking in continuity. Okay, good response. Is there anything left for you to say after that one? No, not really. Oh, I mean, uh, a little bit, but that was a really uh, excellent uh, response from Sammy. Uh, and uh, the ideological element was what I was thinking about, uh, especially because I, uh, I would argue that, yeah, it, when geopolitical tensions are not as highlighted, and especially in Korea where the Cold War politics uh, still have, sh uh, have shaped so much of the uh, the public and political uh, landscape. Uh, when so when the uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, which so, uh, mirror the uh, the Russia uh, the Soviet U.S. Uh, rivalry uh, during the Cold War, uh, so today we have China United States uh, competition. The same language and same sort of framework gets used, and um, uh, middle powerism, uh, middle power diplomacy could be hindered uh, when that kind of uh, tension is less heightened then uh, I, I, I think uh, middle power diplomacy uh, is more of a bureaucratic work that can be done uh, without ga uh, getting much public attention. But in, uh, today, like for example, if we're talking about technological co uh, cooperation with China, this could easily become a headline news where, you know, personal data of South Koreans become uh, exposed to uh, Chinese government or something like that. And, uh, and that could directly impact uh, Korea's potential collaboration with China on uh, you know, uh, some te uh, big scale technology projects. Uh, yeah, so, but that's relation to China. But in terms of middle power diplomacy, uh, I think that forces uh, the government to wonder whether what they're doing in between the United States and China is appropriate and uh, something that wouldn't cause pr uh, problem from either side of the uh, aisle. Okay, you're, you're pretty much jumping ahead of time here because you're going from the domestic to the international. But fair enough, I'm leading into the international anyway. So John Ravenhill also noted that um, these cycles of middle power activism uh, vary according to the international agenda. So he specifically talked about declining tension between superpowers and the declining US hegemony. At that time, Japan was rising. And 
he believed that this led to more middle power activism. And it was very true. So we're, I guess, at the other end of the pendulum swing at the moment, at the moment, uh, a point of time where tension is actually rising between major powers. And as you're more than aware, uh, the tension between China and the US, some people argue the middle power moment could be over. If you think about the Second World War and the Cold War, during periods when security tension is high, middle powers have tended to toe the line and they're not very active. But during periods when uh, security tension decreases, middle powers become more active. So then is the middle power moment over with rising US-China tension? Um, who wants to go first? Anyone can choose. I would, uh, I would try this one. Um, and this is also coming from uh, the perspective of the transatlanticists in my case, um, obviously. But I would say it almost becomes more important now um, just because we have a, if we compare it with the Second World War or the Cold War, um, the, the dependencies in the international system are different um, to previous times, which also um, makes comparisons over time a bit lacking um, because I would argue that each uh, middle power moment is unique. Um, and in the case of South Korea, um, as I argue in my paper, in order for it not to be stuck in the literal middle power um, definition of, of sandwich between the US and uh, China, it actually will take the country more middle power um, activism in what Sammy called principled, respectively figurative, um, to become more of a multilateralist, more of a bridge builder, um, to move itself out of that moment, um, but also to, to see uh, for other like-minded countries in the world, um, which then in turn goes to maintenance of a rules-based order um, and uh, addressing future challenges, for example, as South Korea does with um, sustainability, green growth, development. So I would almost argue that right now is not um, the end of the middle power, that, but a middle power moment, but actually um, almost a new dawn or a window of opportunity. Very, very interesting. Okay, good. That really goes against my devil's advocate uh, position. <laughs> uh, Semi. Um, yes, I think this question can be linked to, uh, in the summer workshop, you gave us this really interesting question. Um, how much agency do middle powers have when there's uh, during periods of great power tension? And I think uh, my, uh, after some thought, I uh, thought that, well, it depends on the middle power in question. You have countries like Australia that maybe decide we're not we're not exercising this middle power role. We're just going to be uh, supportive of the U.S., and you have countries like Korea, which want to maybe conceal where it stands on the spectrum of U.S.-China tensions. And does that, and doing that, I think, creates this illusion that there's a there's a role for middle powers. But in which case, I argue that there isn't. Strategic ambiguity is not a good thing in, in times of U.S.-China tensions. Um, so I think it, I think there's no one answer to that. It would depend on the middle power and how they respond to this great power tensions. Yeah, good, good answer. Uh, Dong Wu. So mine is a bit of a cop-out answer in the sense that uh, my subject area, the fourth industrial revolution or the technology governance, it creates uh, more spaces uh, where uh, for governance, uh, there are needs for governance. Uh, in, uh, so in uh, today where uh, Americans are talking about how they can coordinate uh, their private sector and um, uh, domestic groups in order to participate more actively in the standards making bodies uh, or but they're also talking about AI uh, the quote unquote AI race. Uh, they're also talking about providing funds to developing economies in order to uh, ensure that their ICT infrastructure reflects liberal values quote unquote. So it's really wide. Uh, there is a wide range of initiatives and uh, governance opportunities. And actually, uh, Eric Schmidt uh, from Google, who uh, submitted this paper um, about uh, the U.S.-China strategy to the uh, to to the government, acknowledged that America is not going to be able to take leadership in everything because there are so many things to be done, and that they will have to rely on uh, their allies, uh, their partner economies in order to deliver some of the goals that they have. Uh, 
And in that context, uh, South Korea could, uh, you know, really leverage its, uh, you know, like strong representation in standard making bodies around the world or uh, its credibility with developing economies and provision of ICT infrastructure so that it does act as a uh, as a true middle power, but in niche areas uh, in a way that's less conspicuous. So I think it's a sort of a blue ocean answer that I'm giving. It's not a red ocean, but then we're cre- uh, uh, we're making the pie bigger, so there can be more opportunities for middle powerism. Three very true believers in the middle power concept. <laughs> it's good. It's good. All right. So um, there was there was a a lecture just the other day by an Australian academic, um, a very senior strategist. His name's Hugh White. And he compared Australia and South Korea and how Australia has decided to choose between China and the US and South Korea has positioned itself in the middle. And he noted that the South Korean choice was actually, um, well, a wise choice in many ways. What do you guys think? Do middle powers actually have to choose? Can they stay in the center all that time? I think I already know your answer, Dong Wu. Anyone? I might take the leap here and try and go first. That's a very difficult question because, of course, that's something that's uh, criticized um, in terms of South Korea's strategic ambiguity as well. That if you try um, to stay in the middle for too long, you will be forced to choose eventually, and that will um, strategically have greater fallout for you than if you had chosen in the first place. Um, Then again, it, I would also argue it depends on on the country again um, the the alliances of the country and the history of the country's middle power narrative um, because I would say for Australia it is definitely a different type of choice um, than it is for South Korea um, and so the question comes up that whether choosing between the two sides is actually feasible for South Korea um, or whether there is an opportunity for somewhat a third avenue um, through again multilateral fora etc where South Korea can try and find um, a way to to walk a slightly different path. Um, But I have to admit the question that then follows that is how long will this work um, and will this work out positively in the end? Um, So maybe the other two discussants would have an answer to that. So I mean, you're going to have to bring up our principled middle power diplomacy here. I think so. I think so. Um, I think, well, just to directly answer the question, my answer would be that middle powers do not have to choose. um, But it would be a fallacy to think that by not choosing, middle powers are protecting or acquiring greater agency. Um, And uh, actually, I think it needs to be mentioned that middle powers are not necessarily choosing between China and the U.S., there, it's a calculation of what kind of region that they want to live in and what side can provide that. And it's important to make this distinction because it's not necessarily guaranteed that the U.S. will always behave a certain way and China will always behave a certain way. But we remember uh, how the Trump, under the Trump administration, the, with, the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement, from the CPTPP. And so there's always that risk with another election in the U.S. We could have another great power that downplays the importance of alliances or international institution, international uh, commitments. Um, and so middle powers, uh, by not choosing in the short term, can seem like they're actually winning, but this would be uh, an, an illusion. Um, by practicing principled middle power diplomacy, relying on multilateralism, creation of networks, they're kind of, it's kind of a way to uh, build a soft cushion between uh, the, the potential damages of U.S.-China uh, tensions. Um, and I think my, one of my points was that um, it's, as U.S.-China tension increases and intensifies, it will be very difficult to find a position that satisfies both the U.S. and China. You could have a situation where they're both very upset with South Korea. Uh, you know, in the South Korea Moon Jae-in uh, Biden summit, we had a joint statement that did not mention human rights situation in China as a, as a way of uh, considering South Korea's relationship with China. But China, nevertheless, was still upset. Uh, the ambassador was upset. The foreign minister was upset that uh, I think Taiwan was included. And so this example shows that South Korea will be 
will have a very hard time finding that sweet spot where it's able to satisfy everyone in the U.S.-China tensions. That's good. Dongu. Uh, yeah, I think I was trying to avoid uh, this question uh, because, I, uh, again, like my cop out answer is that we we can uh, you can choose, but in small doses. Um, but ultimately, in the big picture, maybe uh, remain non committed. I I think Femi makes a very strong uh, point on you know being left uh, becoming the, like uh, what is it the the duck egg in Nakdonggang, uh, Oria Nakdonggang. <laughs> Um, yeah, but uh, but I'm still not uh, convinced uh, by the idea that uh, we we should be making a call to uh, to support either or. It should be done. Um, okay, perhaps this is in support of Semi's arguments, uh, principles, or uh, in reference to multilateral organizations. But that's also read. Um, as being political, depending on which uh, organization you support. For example, like the only uh, global uh, body that's uh, focusing on AI right now, it excludes China. Uh, the Global Partnership on AI does not include, I uh, have a Chinese representation. Um, so yeah, everything is political and it's, it's challenging. <laughs> Okay, good. All right. We're almost running out of time, but before we jump to some questions from the audience on YouTube, I want to ask you one question, each of you. So um, in Canada and Australia, throughout the history of them being middle powers, there's always been politicians or academics who have said, no, we're not middle powers. We're something more than that. We are significant powers. We are even great powers. We're entrepreneurial powers. We're pivotal powers. If you have to give South Korea a name and you cannot use the term middle power, what kind of power is it? And you cannot use the term squid power and you cannot use the term K-pop power. What would you call South Korea? Semi? Um, I, there's a, I, I want to call the, uh, South Korea this thing, but... Uh, I know many scholars already use this expression, but I think what really encapsulates South Korea's strength and the kind of aspirations is network power. Uh, South Korea is incredibly well connected with the various uh, uh, countries bilaterally, multilaterally, and various regimes. And I feel like uh, the next stage of South Korea's middle power activism is try to utilize that and really flesh out what it can throughout these networks. So I think network power is how I describe South Korea's middle power identity. I'm pretty sure you just stole Dongwu's answer as well. But um, Carolyn, your turn. Um, I would again say I agree with Sammy. No, um, I. <laughs> um, it's it's that by another name. I almost would have said soft power power, um, which encapsulates, of course, um, the soft power um, potential that we see um, from Korea every day, um, but also the economic potential that I argue for um, in my paper. So it's you know it's a it's a doubling, but it's soft power power. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so. A term that caught my eyes, and we actually talked about it at the beginning of, you know, this uh, work, uh, the early stages of the workshop, the idea of a uh, sondoguka, uh, and I'm not sure how to translate that effectively into English. But then, uh, sondo is like the idea that you uh, you lead by demonstrating, or uh, you lead through good behavior, kind of a thing. And uh, I've noticed uh, President Moon using that expression uh, in a lot of his. Uh, you know, official statements that uh, South Korea will be a sondoguka uh, in, you know, like green, uh, green growth or in governance of digital technology. Uh, in the sense that South Korea takes a lot of hot shots uh, in, uh, in terms of policy. They take aggressive uh, stances depend, uh, that are surprising from time to time, and they're very agile in moving forward in some policy areas. And uh, that could be seen as a good example uh, that earns the uh, leg uh, the um, authority or legitimacy from other economies. So I think that could be a term that uh, uh, I could use, but I would have used network power too, but then you went first. 
Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, I still think squid power is pretty good. But um, All right, we'll avoid that as much as we can. All right, we've got a few questions on uh, the YouTube chat. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, how does access to markets for soft power change South Korea's attitude towards these states? So South Korea has restricted access for its cultural exports to China, but has an open market for its cultural exports to the United States. How does this affect South Korea and its orientation as a middle power? Does anyone want to take that one? Could I just ask a clarification question? Like, that, uh, is the question saying that um, access to Korean and uh, soft power is closed in China? Yeah. 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 It's a difficult one. Uh, I just to get the conversation started, I would say, I mean, this is this is a question related to soft power and it's uh, related to South Korea's cultural attractiveness. Um, the literal phrasing would be that you're getting countries to do what you want without exercising any kind of coercion. And for South Korea, this has been very successful, you know, BTS, Squid Games, Parasite. And I think countries are realizing that this well, maybe China is uh, wary that this kind of cultural power could lead on to uh, or could become embedded in things like political values, which explains this kind of uh, awareness towards Korea's cultural products. I don't think I really answered the question, but just to get the conversation started. Yeah, that's cool. No, it's quite a difficult question. Uh, anyone else want to give a go on that? Because I think there's another question there, which is really, really actually quite interesting for non-Korean speakers. So uh, one of the questions is, um, is, is the differences in definitions of middle powers and in the talk about middle powers just a difference of the people writing the papers? So I've noticed this, that there's a big difference in Korean language papers on middle powers and a difference in English language papers on middle powers. Even the definitions are different. So uh, a question particularly for dong and Semi, have you noticed any differences in the writings between Korean language papers and English language papers? Dongo, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, my my uh, my immediate reaction is that. No, not so much. I think, if anything, uh, it, it depended more on the uh, different school of thought of international relations that each scholar subscribed to. Uh, in terms of language, not so much. Uh, no, I, I did think about how, you know, I think it's been written about it as well, but the, how the Korean Sadejui, uh, uh, the idea, the historical uh, idea of kowtowing to Beijing, uh, could be contextualized uh, differently or sort of perpetuate the so same uh, notion of uh, humiliation, or uh, but it could be re repackaged into smart uh, diplomacy. But yeah, no, I haven't thought about that really. I actually noticed like uh, strategy that comes across in English language papers as well. But what didn't come across in English language papers, I thought, was more the network diplomacy, like papers by Kim Sung uh, Kim Sung Bae. He writes a lot about network diplomacy and a lot about your ideas, uh, Dong Wu, uh, when he's writing about middle powers. And um, I haven't really seen that in English language papers all that much. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I would agree. I'm not sure if there's a difference in terms of the, the literal uh, translation. I do know in Korean literature, there are maybe a few ways to, to talk about middle powers. Um, maybe there's a, a maybe there's a tendency to use it maybe in spatial terms, geographic terms, rather than an abstract or conceptual way. But other than that, I don't. I'm not aware of uh, this kind of uh, usage in, in a linguistic sense. Okay, good. Caroline, anything to add? What about um, it? For, yeah, go ahead. 
Sorry, for me, it's um, it's very interesting as my my understanding of, of Korean as a language is still very much involving um, to just know that as well, because in terms of also accessibility as a researcher, um, I find it very important to be able to understand the local debate, um, because I'm also from a non-English speaking country. Um, and so, of course, you find that the conversation at home, so to speak, is um can definitely vary um, from what is uh, predominant in, for example, the English speaking literature. So that's been very interesting. Excellent. Uh, that was, yeah, a stimulating conversation. So I've got one last question for you guys. One very last question. And that is middle powers change, great powers change, all powers change. South Korea, is it always going to be a middle power? Could it one day be a great power. I mean, think unification could be in the future. Guys, is it always going to be a middle power? I might uh, take that one just because you said unification and I'm German and we had unification, which for us very much um, changed the conversation and also our um, our role um, in the EU, for example. Of course, admittedly, our history as a country is very different. Um, but there's also a conversation whether Germany is a middle power, for example, or whether Germany is more of a uh, borderline, not great power, but a stronger power just because of, yeah, it's, it's, it's economic power, um, it's soft power initiatives within the EU, for example. Um, I don't want to say it's a question of, of size. I think in the near future, um, I would not see um, South Korea become um, akin to a great power simply because it's inhibited by um, various factors such as the US and China being much stronger. And of course, um, the North Korea question, which still takes precedence um, in, in South Korea's policy and foreign policy. Um, could it down the line become a great power? I would say that also very much depends on um, the international system we face then, because it may be that we also redefine um, our definition of, of great powers, because nobody knows whether um, the rivalry between China and the US will look anything like the rivalry between um, the US and the Soviet Union. So I think that really depends on what um, the future brings in that regard. Good, very good. Same I think um, we can dis, uh, we can dissect the idea of power in many ways. I think culturally, South Korea is already a very strong, uh, great power. Um, but what won't change is South Korea's geography. Geography, like uh, Caroline said, um, if we focus on the military or economic aspect of power, South Korea will always be surrounded by China and Japan. And in that sense, uh, I'm not so optimistic about South Korea's path to a great power status. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I agree uh, in the sense that we, uh, South Korea is limited by geography, uh, both location and size. And uh, there are some legitimate concerns about, you know, pop uh, population dec uh, decline and such. Uh, so uh, not very optimistic about uh, Korea becoming a great power, although there are many, many like historical re uh, revisionist or fantasy novelists who write about the history of uh, Balhae or Goguryeo and how Korea, uh, some Korean archaeologists that uh, claim uh, some treasure that allows South Korea to become a great power, but uh, I don't see that happening in real life. Okay, very good discussion. Thank you all very much for contributing and I encourage everybody watching to read those papers and to go ahead and read other papers on the KEI website. They're all very good. And these ones in particular, if you're interested in South Korea's middle power, I think they're a good read. Thank you all very much.